Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I have a great show for you today, a fascinating topic. I'm interviewing an author, Derek Gilbert. You're going to want to see this. Let me say before I get into the interview that we have our Tipping Point Conference coming up, our Prophecy Conference coming up September 20th and 21st. The tickets are on sale right now. We have tickets. You can come physically. We also have live streaming that's available. Go to conference.endtimes.com. This is going to be a Friday night and all day Saturday. We're adding the Friday night. And we have Pastor Jack Hibbs. A lot of you are familiar with Jack Hibbs. He's very well known, has a television show uh, that's on all the time. And a lot of you have been asking for us to have him. So he's coming to be a part. He'll be our keynote speaker on Friday night. I'll be there. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, uh, Pastor Ed Young, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, of course, Billy Crone will be there also. We have a big lineup. And we have coming this year Max Licato. Max is a dear friend of mine. He is the number one best selling Christian author. Of all times, his books have sold more copies than any other books except the Bible. He is a brilliant teacher, and he's going to be teaching. He's written books and speaks on the end times. You're going to want to hear him. He's going to be fascinating. So we've got a great lineup of speakers. I want you to be a part of it. So go right now to conference.endtimes.com. You can select your seat there. We have all different kinds of pricing and, and seats available. And so you need to get it while they're still available because we're expecting this to fill up this year. Go right now to conference.endtimes.com. want to see you there. Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. It is my great pleasure today to have joining me on the show, Derek Gilbert. He's the co-host of Unraveling Revelation with his wife, Sharon. They've co-authored the books, Veneration and Giants, Gods and Dragons. And he's joining me today to discuss his most recent book, The Second Coming of Saturn. Derek, thank you for joining me today. It is an honor. Thank you for having me. Well, what I love about your book, you know, and I've heard people talk about things like you have in your book. But this is so pertinent to the days that we're living in. Uh, and, you know, there, there is a presence of evil. Uh, your book, by the way, is called the, S- the Second Coming of Saturn. And you're going to explain what this is. But it's very, very fascinating. And I think, you know, I, I've said to people, you know, I just, I've taught on the end time for 41 years. I just never thought I would see a world like this. And so in, you, in your book, you call this the Second Coming of Saturn. Uh, are you saying that the Roman god Saturn is real? Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, and, and this we, we draw a lot on the work of uh, our, our good friend, the late Dr. Tom Horn, but also on Dr. Michael Heiser, who yeah. also was called home by the Lord last yeah. year. Uh, his his book, the the uh, uh, the unseen realm, and uh, then other books that kind of built on that. Uh, that foundational research like uh, reversing Hermon and uh, his readers uh, uh, companions or his commentaries on the uh, the book of first Enoch really help us to understand what was in the mind of the Hebrew prophets and the apostles uh, and the early church fathers for that matter they understood that the pagan gods of their neighbors such as Saturn Jupiter Apollo were real entities but they yeah. were fallen angels and uh, I think we can agree that Satan is one of those fallen angels Jesus in fact in the uh, New Testament identifies him. Um, he's when he was accused of uh, casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, which means Baal the prince. He says, "If Satan casts out demons by his own power, how will Satan's kingdom stand?" So he's connecting Satan to Baal. He also does it in Revelation chapter two, the letter to Pergamum, where he says, "I know where you live, where Satan dwells." That's a reference to the great altar of Zeus. Well, Zeus was the storm god and the king of the pantheon for the Greeks, just as Baal was the storm god, king of the pantheon for the Canaanites. So we we know Satan, as a fallen angel, was Zeus, Jupiter, Baal, Saturn. Uh, I decided to do a deep dive. This really builds on research that Sharon and I have been doing for the last eight years. Uh, Who was this entity, Saturn? What role does he play? And when we start pulling on the historical threads, and what the apostles, the prophets, the early church knew, uh, what the pagans around ancient Israel knew. We can identify this character, I think, as the leader of the rebellion in Genesis chapter 6, described very briefly in four verses in Genesis, uh, the leader of the sons of God, these fallen angels who came to earth, 
commingled with humanity. And then in the book of First Enoch, we learn the extent of their sin, not just commingling their seed with that of humanity, but also teaching us forbidden knowledge. And it was clear to the prophets and the apostles that that was why the world is in the state it's in. Yes, the Genesis 3 fall in the Garden of Eden, very important. That is what got us kicked out of God's uh, garden, his holy mountain. Eden was on a mountain, Ezekiel 28. But the sin in Genesis chapter 6, where we were convinced by these entities not only to worship them, but then to practice these occult rituals and yeah. divination and spell casting and so forth, uh, there is a lot packed in there. The book, The Second Coming of Saturn, actually it was intended to address one question. What happened to the leader of that rebellion and I think the answer is not only is he the character called Kronos by the Greeks, Saturn by the Romans, and a number of other names throughout the ancient world, uh, but he will return in Revelation 9 as the destroyer, Abaddon or Apollyon. How has, and you talked about the book of First Enoch. Now, the book of First Enoch is not canonized, but I believe, now not Second Enoch and other books, but First Enoch, it's a special book because it gives very special revelation from Enoch as to the identity of these fallen angels and what they did, and actually the origin of demons. But you, you talked mm -hmm. about, you know, Saturn will return. This is coming the, called the second coming of Saturn. And really, Derek, it really helps to explain some of the things that are happening in the world right now, because you talk about a conjunction, the great conjunction. Talk about that for just a minute. On the winter solstice of 2020, December 21st, and the solstices, uh, the winter, uh, summer solstice, these are very important dates for occultists. Now, as Christians, we understand our fates, our destinies are not governed by the movements of planets in the sky or uh, right. you know, certain points in the calendar year, like the solstices, uh, solstices, the equinoxes. But there are very important, very wealthy people in this world who do, even to this day. I mean, uh, we as Christians, you know, many of us consider Ronald Reagan to be the greatest American president, least in the modern era, but uh, we forget that his calendar was set by his wife, Nancy, in consultation with her astrologer, Gene yeah, Dixon. Yeah. So this is not an unusual concept. Um, on December 21st, you might remember the, uh, of 2020, the news was full of stories about the Christmas star, how Jupiter and Saturn were coming together in the night sky, and that this is probably what the, the wise men saw back 2,000 years ago. Well, no, it's not what they saw, but more importantly, for astrologers and for occult adepts who are looking for signs to begin a new age. This is not just a term. They really are looking to kick off a new era of human civilization. This marked the uh, transfer of power, as it were, from Jupiter back to Saturn. Now, if you remember Greek and Roman mythology, the story was that Saturn, Kronos in his Greek incarnation, took over control of the uh, of, of creation from the, their father the sky god uh, oranos in the greek pantheon um and he in turn was overthrown by his son the storm god zeus or jupiter who uh, cast him down to tartarus the bottomless pit uh, in the year 40 bc toward the end of the life of julius caesar the beginning of the reign of octavian who became caesar augustus a roman poet named virgil who's trying to please his patrons, I guess. So when you're a poet, you need wealthy patrons to you know, put bread on your table. Uh, he suggested that the, the reign of Caesar Augustus, the reign of Octavian, would lead to a new golden age, which uh, um, so justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Now, uh, this has been interpreted various ways over the centuries. In fact, Emperor Constantine in the fourth century who legalized Christianity in the right. Roman Empire, took that took that as a prophecy of Jesus Christ. When you read v Virgil's poem called the Fourth Eclogue, it's clear that this is not a prophecy, uh, a Christian prophecy, a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Uh, we, we tried that back in Genesis chapter 6. It didn't end well. Yeah. Um, but there are those who still see this as a future golden age. This is based on uh, the Greek poet Hesiod, who saw that uh, back in the days when Kronos ruled in heaven, there was a, a race of men who had all good things. That was the golden age. Then it was followed by a silver age, which is not quite as good, a bronze age, which was uh, harsh, and then the iron age, which is the age in which uh, Virgil was living at the time he wrote that poem. But they're looking forward to Saturn's return, 
the return of Kronos, the return of this entity, Shemiyaza, the leader of the Watchers from Genesis chapter 6, to bring with them a golden age. And I think that there is a powerful group, uh, the, the type of people who will attend events like uh, the World Economic Forum, right. which just concluded in Davos, Switzerland, right. um, who think that th this, this transfer of power was signaled by the Great Conjunction on the winter solstice of 2020. And what's really interesting, uh, Jimmy, is that uh, that took place, uh, the, the meeting of Saturn and Jupiter in the night sky at zero degrees of the constellation Aquarius, which means that effectively on the winter solstice of 2020, 50 years after that uh, song was a hit, you know, the age of Aquarius, right. yeah. we are now, according to astrologers, fully in the age of Aquarius. And I think these people, the wealthy, those who want to reset human civilization along their lines think that this is the beginning of a new golden age we're going to get right back to the show listen if you want to support us here at endtimes.com there's two ways you can do it one is by becoming a subscriber seven dollars a month you get the full tipping point show every week without advertisements plus all the other podcasts and information that we have we have updates from israel every week Dr. Mark Hitchcock has a teaching, a podcast every week, all kinds of things that we do. I answer questions. I bring a devotional every week, $7 a month. You can also give to us. You can go to endtimes.com right now. There's a donate button and just give a gift. Nothing is too small. Nothing is too large. And you can give a recurring gift. It's a huge blessing to us because we're, we're in a war uh, in the world right now spiritually. This is a very severe time. And I believe the most important message in the world right now is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we preach the gospel and people get saved through this show, but also helping people understand the times that we're living in. A lot of people are depressed. A lot of people are suicidal because of the things that are happening in the world. We come alongside people to encourage them and help you to understand this is what's going on. And even though it looks like bad news, it's good news because Jesus Christ is coming. If you want to help us get this message out, become a subscriber, $7 a month. Or you can also just go to endtimes.com and donate to us. Just, just give us a gift, a recurring gift. Anything that you give is a blessing and it helps us to take this message out. Let's go back to the show. Well, it sure seems like to me, Derek, you were talking about the conjunction. It, it seems like evil has increased. You know, in the last few years, it's just there. It's a, it's something palpable. We look back to October seventh, uh, the Hamas attacks, which were uh, you know unparalleled in, uh, maybe not unparalleled in human history, but certainly in modern history, of uh, just this horrific violence there. And then the anti-Semitism that's in the world right now, which is a spirit, and I've said it before, anti-Semitism is not a, it's not a ideology. It's a spirit because no one can articulate it of why they hate the Jews. You know, they all have their different reasons. But it's just like something has been released in a new level. And I think that what you're saying is it goes back to the conjunction. Because, you know, Genesis 1 says that God uh, created the sun, moon, and stars for signs and for seasons. And he, God uses the sun, moon, and stars, not for the same reason the astrologers do, but for his own reasons. And so I just think that it seems to me, when I was reading your book, it makes sense because not only do we know from Genesis 6, and, and you were talking about the golden age, it says they were men of renown. And I was reading, and this is Genesis 6, it talks about there were giants on the earth, men of renown. Well, the one of the commentaries I was reading said the reason that the writer didn't go, Moses didn't go into detail is because people of that age would have known what he was talking about. It didn't need a reference right. point. They knew who they were. Well, now we look back, that's Saturn, that's Apollo, that's all these different uh, figures that we look back on. Many people look back at those as mythological figures. They're not mythological figures. Those were actual figures. So, so go ahead with what you're saying. How does this how does this, the conjunction and what you're talking about, how does this affect us today? Well, I, I think you hit on one aspect of it with the uh, the attack on October 7th by Hamas. Um, and uh, we, we just want to acknowledge that uh, friends of ours who've led several of the tours that Sharon and I have taken to uh, Israel 
are now uh, serving in the IDF reserves. So you've got <clears throat> men who, uh, you know, not to insult them, but they're they're years past their peak fighting age who are right. now, and women too, who are uh, now right. serving in the reserves. Uh, in fact, an archaeologist we spent a day with uh, visiting megalithic sites on the Golan Heights last March, now serving in the reserves and protecting um, communities in the north of Israel. So, uh, but this goes way, way back. I, th- I think we can trace this back. In fact, I'm going to do a uh, uh, th- this is going to be part of a book that Sharon and I are working on for later this year. My wife Sharon and I have co-authored two and working on another one called The Gates of Hell. Um, w- I think this conflict for Israel uh, goes back to this rebellion in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, the Canaanites knew this entity called uh, Kronos by the Greeks and Saturn by the Romans. They called him El. Not El Elyon or El Shaddai, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but El of the Canaanites, who was the father god of their pantheon, who, like uh, like Kronos and Zeus, was replaced at the top of the pantheon by the storm god, Baal. There are a number of sites in and around Israel that were sacred to this entity. Right. Uh, and in the book, The Second Coming of Saturn, I trace all of the identities and this is this was known to uh, the pagan authors of the classical world. They've got uh, uh, multilingual god lists that have been discovered by archaeologists over the last century, sort of like the uh, clay tablet version of Google Translate, where they will list all of the gods of the, the Canaanites here and all the gods of the Akkadians here and all the gods of the Babylonians here, the gods of the Hurrians here. And that way you knew who you were supposed to pray to in the various languages. Um, El of the Canaanites was known as... Um, Asher to the Assyrians. He was called Enlil by the Babylonians. He was known as Milcom to the Ammonites, which means he is Molech of the Hebrews. Wow. So this entity, Kronos, Saturn, El, was Molech. And Molech is probably the most reviled, uh, notorious of the pagan gods in the Bible. I mean, this is the one who is demanding child sacrifice. Yeah. Well, yeah, so did Kronos of the Greeks. So did Saturn of the Romans. His Phoenician counterpart, Baal Haman. Uh, likewise, the Tophets of the Phoenicians are infamous in the ancient world. At Carthage, on the islands of Sardinia, Sicily, southern Spain, they found these uh, multiple uh, cemeteries with, with uh, the, the remains of young infants under the age of two. This is who this entity is. And this is the entity who wanted to claim the land that God had declared his since the time of Abraham, when he pointed Abraham to Mount Moriah for the binding of Isaac, uh, this entity, even though he is chained up in the abyss, and we know this from Second Peter 2, verse 4, where he, he says, uh, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them down to, our English Bibles say hell, but the word in Greek is Tartarosis, not Hades. Tartarus is a separate place reserved for supernatural rebels. Wow. This entity... And his colleagues from Genesis chapter 6, those sons of God, they are the entities in Tartarus. In other words, the titans of the Greeks and the Romans are the watchers, the sons of God from Genesis chapter 6. Same group, just uh, the Bible has the real news version and the mythology we were taught in high school is the fake news version. So this entity, Milcom, El, Kronos, Saturn, whatever you want to call him, convinced Solomon shortly after completing construction of the temple on the Temple Mount convinced Solomon to build a high place. He built several, actually, one for Astarte, one for Chemosh, but one for Milcom, Molech, Enlil, El, etc., on the Mount of Olives to the east. And uh, anyone who's been to Israel knows that the Mount of Olives is higher than the Temple Mount. Right. So when you opened the door of Solomon's temple, you would look across the Kidron Valley and look up on this high place for this entity, Molech. And uh, Jesus, I think, uh, signaled the importance of this long war against this particular entity by what he did during the final week of his life, where he spent the last week of his life dividing his time between teaching in the temple, on the Temple Mount, and teaching on the Mount of Olives. Hmm. He raised Lazarus from the dead there. He delivered the Olivet Discourse, his longest teaching on what would happen in the end times on this mountain. He was arrested there, he was crucified there, buried there, descended into the abyss, according to First Peter 3.19, he, where he proclaimed to yeah. the spirits in prison. He basically went down and declared victory over this entity, Saturn, Kronos, El, Molech. And then he was uh, raised up again, and according to the Gospel of Luke, he ascended into heaven from Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives. And of course, Zechariah 14 tells us he returns to the Mount of Olives. Right. So this entity, El of the Canaanites, with his 
holy place on Mount Hermon, which is the northernmost mountain in Israel and the highest mountain anywhere near Israel. Um, a, a scholar referred to it as the Canaanite Olympus. To think about it that way is where the Canaanites believe their gods met. That's where Jesus went for the transfiguration. Right. At the base of that mountain, Caesarea Philippi is where yeah. he declared his divinity. Blessed are you, Peter. Uh, and uh, you've got uh, the, the Carmel, which is means vineyard of El. You've got Bethel, which means house or temple of El. Um, and he, his other identity, known to the Philistines as Dagon, the chief god of the Philistines, even well into the Christian era, the chief god, the patron god of the city of Gaza, called uh, Marnus, just another name for Dagon or El or Molech. Same entity. And I think, Jimmy, one of the most fascinating uh, takeaways from the study of this particular entity is that he is in the abyss, he and his colleagues, locked up in chains in gloomy darkness, according to Peter and Jude, while Satan still wanders the earth. Is this entity even more dangerous than Satan? God found it necessary to lock these fellows up while still wandering the earth, tempting, lying, destroying. Um, he gets out at the end for five months but uh, only five months. But I think this long war, even from his prison cell in the bottomless pit, is still working through minions to influence things, influence things in this world. As we know now for the fifth consecutive year, the number one cause of death on earth is the sacrifice of children through abortion. Hey, thanks for joining me today. Be sure and subscribe to this channel and also like this channel so that other people will be able to see it.